Potawatomi, arts, culture, and entertainment. This is a Peace Production. Uh, so with that, please put your hands together for Andy Peters. Thank you, Adam. Adam's our programming director. He does a great job. He runs the gallery that's up on the fourth floor. He's a curator of all these little drawings that we're going to talk about tonight. I sort of volunteered to put this together on my own because they never offered to pay me. And so, and, but I think these drawings are really fabulous. They're kind of the crown jewel in our collection. They're early frontier drawings from the 1850s. There was an earlier installment of this that was done, part one was last November. This is going to be, tonight is going to be part two, and it's going to be the Nebraska side of the river. So it's going to show drawings after the various frontier waves of Mormons and pioneers moved west in three different parts. Um, I, actually, I am kind of getting paid for this. Adam gave me some free drink tickets. <laughs> and that's money. And, and uh, it, one, time I was, one time I did a presentation in Omaha, and afterwards a guy came up to me and goes, boy, that would really work for our little church group. He said, we're called the prime timers on account of, you know, we're older. And he said, I said, well, you know, show me the money. What, what can you pay me? It's the middle of a weekday, and it's in Millard, and I've got to bring my own equipment. It's going to be a, it's going to shoot a hole in the middle of the day. He goes, we can pay 50 bucks. I said, I thought, oh, man, that's really not a good business model. <laughs> so, so I said, I said, you know, is that all you got, really? And he goes, well, he goes, I'll tell you what. You come 45 minutes early, we're having a potluck lunch. <laughs> I said, you're on, partner. And it was really nice. They were really nice people. We had this great conversation. And when they found out I was a bachelor, I got all the leftovers. <laughs> there was like... There's like apple crisp, apple strudel, apple brown betty, apple crumble. And there was, a, there, was this, there was a spaghetti casserole with crumbled potato chips on top. I mean, it was good home cooking. It was, it was lucrative. <laughs> one, of the, one of the drawings we looked at last time uh, was early Counts of Luffs. This is done by this artist, George Simons. And we have 71 of his drawings in our collection here that were a gift to us from the Laneson family and were originally the portfolio in the private possession of, of General Grenville M. Dodge. This drawing was done from up on Bluff Street where St. Peter's Catholic Church is now and it's looking north up Broadway through the century block. He has drawn this thing from a bird's eye perspective and included every building that was there at the time, and people and wagons and livestock. It looks a little primitive on first blush, but he can really draw beautifully, and all of his landmarks are in the proper locations, including the kinds of buildings that took this from a wilderness in the 1840s to 10 years later, this drawing was in the, was in the 1850s. So that was part one. We dealt with those drawings. We saw George Simons for the first time, who was a red-haired, blue-eyed Irishman from Streeter, Illinois, which was also the hometown of his neighbor, Grenville M. Dodge. Grenville M. Dodge was hired to survey for the Rock Island Railway across the wilderness of Iowa that was rolling prairie with Baroque savanna occasionally. No buildings, no habitation to speak of at all. And eventually in 1853, they would arrive in Counts of Luffs. About halfway across on the Coon River at the site of where is now Des Moines, Iowa, George Simons completed this drawing, showing his talents as a draftsman and it was, and this is kind of why I'm connected to it. If the same thing is true of Audubon, the frontier artist, and Carl Bodmer, the frontier artist. You got to go hunting and fishing and camp out and get paid for it. It was, <laughs> it was like Lewis and Clark, a line of work, work that's really not, you know, very readily available anymore to this day. 
but I just couldn't imagine a greater adventure than that. And a beautiful drawing that shows the details in the camp. He was a camp cook, was his job description. So it's entirely possible that's him on the left hand stirring the pot. This is part two where we cross the Missouri River. And everything net from this point forward will be on the Nebraska side in three parts. One of the ways that you got across the river was on this ferry, which was a packet steamer. A packet steamer was a boat that worked in a local area on a more or less regular schedule. This one might have operated, say, between Sioux City and Nebraska City, but mostly around here. It says Omaha on the side. There's, there's um, some habitation shown on the left bank. I presume we're looking upstream here. And then up, in, up at Florence, at a the approximate location of the Mormon Bridge, here is the same steamer, and it's pulled up on the bank, and the people that are arranged before it that are so well turned out are Mormons. They've had a pretty rough go of it, but apparently they were attentive to their wardrobe. Um, in, as we look at it closer, we can see the smoke from other steamers farther up and the Bear Bluffs would be up around Hummel Park, for example. So you can see there was no timber. There's interesting things like that that we can learn historically from what these drawings show. On the right hand appears to be a Native American on horseback. And he has urged his horse forward to take a look at this steamer. And I, I commend them both because my experience is that horses don't like things that are big and noisy and foreign and smoke comes out of them. They don't like any of those things. So a combination, I um, think that's probably a pretty good horse. But it gets worse actually because here we can see two horses hitched to a wagon in a rowboat. Well, you know, I, just loading them onto the rowboat from the riverbank on the Iowa side strikes terror in my heart. If this thing, if, if one of these horses gets squirrely, the whole thing goes overboard and the catastrophe that follows, I just, is more than, than I really kind of want to imagine. But nobody else in frontier history is writing about this sort of thing. They're not writing about what it was like getting across that river and, and especially getting livestock across. On another on an etching that's tinted that's at the library, we can see another example of wagons going across on a flatboat. I don't see the, the livestock on this one. I see a lot of figures on that one. But the livestock are on the landward side, particularly oxen that would be pulling wagons. And so you might ask the question, you know, wh why didn't they swim the livestock across the river? And um, I, tr I have tried that myself, not on purpose, but um, it's, um, it's a little abstract. You, there's no steering, and I would hate to try it with a whole herd of them. And so swimming across doesn't appeal to me, and neither does the boat. I, I think the frontier was, was really uh, not for everybody. But here's another steamer in a drawing by George Simons, frontier artist. And we can see on this little steamer, which is different than the Omaha, you see, this one is a smaller, flatter boat, and it has a covered wagon with a hitched team on the rear deck and on the foredeck. That, to me, is very interesting, how they loaded them. If you look on this drawing to the left, let's go um, to the name of the drawing first. As you've seen maybe on the table nearby, these drawings are tiny. And so I like to put them up on a screen and sort of enlarge them so we can look at them together and sort of scrutinize them. This one, he's got his, his perspective is a little cockeyed. It's, it's a tilted to the right, but he did another copy of it. So let's look at that copy, which happens to be a little more square. We can see the steamer. We can see the wagons on it, but the other wagons that are queuing up on the Iowa side are upstream. And there seems to, there appears to be a little cut in the bank. So probably it's the current has pushed that ferry down river and he is literally up on the hill that's just south of the Durham, where the Durham Museum is today. And he's looking at this boat as it's coming back up the current and, and they've probably literally driven those wagons onto the deck. This is downtown Omaha. St. Mary's Catholic Church was the first Catholic Church. There was no 8th Street. There was just footpaths, basically. The Snowden uh, 
family ran the ferry itself. That was their office. And you can see the, the floor plan of their home was 16 feet by 18 feet. St. Nicholas Hotel was the first hotel in town. 12th and Jackson is right in the old market on the southwest corner of it. There, this was in 1855. There were 20 homes. George Simons, frontier artist, has even included the false storefronts very carefully from his perch on the hill. He has been at pains for us to be able to see what the very first businesses looked like in downtown Omaha. That is the home there of the Wainwright. Who knows what a Wainwright is? You know what a Wainwright is? That's a wagon builder. That's probably an old English term. But there are, that's like the first auto mechanic. You can see on the lower left-hand side of that building that there's a broken wagon with a wheel leaning up against the corner of the shack. And of course, the smoke coming out of the shack is the forge of the blacksmith where he's hammering iron hoops into wheels and things like that. Um, so the artist can draw. He can draw in perspective. He is not embellishing. He's not romanticizing. In other words, there's no ego involved at all. He has no attitude. He is simply crunching it on those tiny sheets of paper to try and record history as best he can. And the fact that these drawings survived as beautifully as they did, well, that's a story that we'll actually get to. This is the first cabin in Omaha a year before. His spelling, not mine. And, and I don't know what the number in the circle is. That was somebody else added later. So here are these four figures in the foreground. There's the first cabin in Omaha after the treaty was signed and the Omaha people removed to the northern portion of the state where, they're, where they originally came from and where they still dwell to this day. There are teepees in the upper right-hand corner of their Native American residents sharing the lawn, and in the bottom of the picture we can see the names of the individuals, including Mr. Peterson and Mr. Jones in the middle. It's interesting because in this, in the era before photography, we don't have any records of what the world looked like, only descriptions. We don't have any pictures of it. And yet Mr. Jones, we know him through historical accounts as Mr. A.D. Jones, an early, an early citizen of Omaha, is the first postman, and he's actually he's facing, the can he's facing the artist. He's facing out of the picture plane as, as if it's a kind of a posed, a posed fi uh, picture. So I, th I find that unique. And then there was a larger painting that was commissioned from that drawing and other drawings that we saw just a moment ago. So there's Mr. Jones, Mr. Peterson, the other figures. And that painting is called The First Mail Carrier. It's a large painting. And it's in the collection at the, historical General Do at the historic General Dodge House, just up the street. <clears throat> so Mr. A.D. Jones has removed his hat and is handing the first letter, that he's the first mail carrier. And Mr. Peterson, we don't know a great deal about him except that my perception is, is that Mr. Peterson hasn't completed the hunter safety course. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that you learn in hunter safety is you don't drag your gun around at the end of the barrel. <laughs> If this thing goes off accidentally, the mailman catches one right between the eyes. <laughs> so then the title of the thing is like, you know, his first, you know, first and last mail delivery by this guy. <laughs> but it's a beautiful painting, and it's very elaborate. It's true to the sketches. It looks up the Missouri River and down below that hill. This is the hill where, where the Grace Bible Institute was for years. And it was on that hill where the artist sat. And there is downtown Omaha, exactly as he portrayed it in his sketches. So the sketches were the preliminary drawings that informed his studio work. Native Americans that he's added in the foreground are watching their frontier change before their very eyes. The artist is using a red foreground accent as a picture-making device as well. There's the ferry steamer still being pushed downstream by the current. We can see the cut in the bank of the river by the wagons 
where the wagons are run down onto the deck. So the artist was so perceptive. He wasn't pulling punches and he wasn't glossing over. In the background, we can see an oxbow lake, and beyond that, we can see a big ravine. Now, in part one, we learned that that oxbow was the original channel of the river and it ran right against the bluffs. And that would have been the channel that Lewis and Clark and Bodner and Maximilian had used before the river changed. That channel looked like this and had that hook in the end about where Walmart is on North 16th Street. And of course, most of that is now Big Lake Park. You can see the two roads coming in from the right of Minster Springs and DeLong Avenue. That's where the very first farm was located. This was in the place that the river came up against the bluffs until you got down to St. Joe. The rest of the time it was wandering around on the floodplain. You couldn't dock a steamer there and get the goods off it. You needed to have the river against the bluffs. On the west side, it was at Bellevue. But on the east side, this was a very, very important stop historically. And we can see now that not too long before that, the river was cut off from the main channel. The Wainwright's shop is still in the same location. That's about where where Cubby's old market grocery store is. <laughs> if you can imagine, there's 20 houses total. And there's two wagons that are going westbound to the left. So they would be going up Douglas Street, Farnham Street, and they're going to go up to the top of the hill by where is Central High as they start to make their way west. And from the top of that hill, this is the view that they're going to get. <laughs> that looked like fun to you. And then they've got about 300 miles of that along the Platte River just to get to the forks of the Platte. And then they're not even halfway to Salt Lake. I mean, if the Mormons. So there, that had to be a little bit of a daunting spectacle. Here's the painting, museum frame, um, as you'd seen at the General Dodge House. I have a theory about how it got there and why it got there. If you stood where those teepees are, where the artist was when he looked down in Omaha, um, that ravine that's down on the right, that is now 8th Street coming down off that hilltop, looking north toward downtown Omaha. Um, ConAgra and the Union Pacific facilities can be seen there in the midground, and that's where the downtown was located in that sketch. You can see here how much it's changed in 170 years. Is that a little Italy? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 10th Street, 8th Street. Here's an early here, here's another painting by George Simons that's from the Museum of Nebraska Art in Kearney, originally in Jocelyn. And we can see Mr. A.D. Jones again. It was obviously informed by the original er, uh, first mail carrier painting and, and drawings. But there's one thing different about this painting that tells a lot. And that is that the postman who is constantly removing his hat has got his hat full of letters. That's where he carried the stuff in the days before he had a mailbag. And actually that's also been corroborated by, um, by a, a book called The Prairie Blossoms that tells us a, a little bit about A.D. Jones as leading songs in church in an early service. So that's another version of the earliest mail carrier. On that same spot is a log cabin that according to the writing in the lower margin which says this. Was the cabin, was the location of, of the later house of Herman Kuntz. Herman Kuntz and his brothers were in finance and banking and railroads and, and built on that hilltop. And that was the house they built. That was the house that Herman and his family built called Forest Hill. And that was torn down in 1942, according to Neely Kuntz, who sent me these pictures and said that his mother told him that that, that was the time that, he, that that house came down, Grace Bible Institute. The point is, is that we know that's where the artist sat, was on that hill, can be corroborated. But what I like the best about that inscription or that drawing is this particular portion of it, which sounds pretty frightening, 
like you know to be attacked and and run 25 miles off your farm and back to Omaha to your cabin for almost a year and so we're about to learn more about just how that happened the Dodge farms were located out along the Elkhorn River just below, just south, just downstream of where Highway 36 runs east and west from Bennington to, to Fremont. The Omaha tribe was still in control of most of that country, so you couldn't start, you couldn't make a claim there. The Homestead Act was still a, a, a half a decade away, but you could not make a claim on their land, so the Dodges wanted to start a farm, and here is a painting of that particular location from a bluff that's above Highway 36, looking south this time. Sylvanus Dodge was the father of Grenville and N.P. Dodge. Grenville and N.P. Dodge were brothers. Their dad was Sylvanus. He had followed them out from Illinois. He couldn't wait to get a farm going. His farm is in the lower left. Grenville Dodge's farm is in the midground, and then we'll study this closer. Here is the drawings that would inform that big oil painting. We can see the farm on the lower left. We can see a man standing and a man on horseback in a garden that has been fenced in from wild animals that would want to get in there and browse. A four-horse hitch pulling a walk-behind single-bit middle breaker plow. Well, these are unique in the world of art that they have been chronicled in this way. There's an oxbow lake there. There's still oxbows along the Elkhorn today, but not in the same places. Here's another version of the same drawing. Now, we've seen this before when we see a kind of a tattered, discolored drawing, and then we see a more careful, brighter version. And the reason that there's two sets, we can see in the background here, there are wagons that are staging on the edge of the river. This is a letter from 120 some years ago that is the smoking gun that tells us why there are two sets. One of the sets of drawings is in the permanent collection at Pace and they have been restored and conserved Ford Conservancy, Conservancy in Omaha. The other set is, is also stabilized in the collection of the Council Bluffs Library. So the set that we have is predominantly what were George Simon's original sketches. <clears throat> <laughs> and I at once picked out about 50 for him to copy for me. So that was by, this letter is from in 1893. So he has gifted a whole set of, of copies to his brother, Renville Dodge, who is living in the Dodge house up the street. So that gave George Simons, who was a kind of a regular resident in Council Bluffs, some work to do. He had a patron in N.P. Dodge. He would later have a patron again in Grenville Dodge who had followed his success all the way along. The immigrant ferry is in the upper middle portion of this drawing. And this is a map that shows how they got across the river. That was a north-south ferry. I've talked to the farmer who lives there now, and he says that ferry is in the middle of a cornfield because that channel is no longer there and it hasn't been for a long time. He says the previous owner actually diverted the river, that the river didn't change because of flooding. So the artist, George Simons, was sitting up on the top of this bluff looking south over this farm and taking in this whole scene and then he's going to move out into the midground between the two farms of the Dodges. And he's going to look back toward us and do another sketch. And that sketch looks like this. This is Sylvanus Dodges farm. We can see Native Americans coming to the forest in the backdrop. We can see Sylvanus out in his garden. We can see his horse on a picket stake in the pasture, that means that he doesn't have any fencing up yet that's large enough to contain a big pasture. There is a barn and a paddock beyond. 
Now on the upper left hand, there's promontory, the artist is going to go there and look down looking west for another preliminary drawing to make that beautiful painting. Here it is. Now he is farther on down to the south. The oxbow is in the lower right hand corner of this drawing. All of the livestock that's turned out to graze would be from mostly Mormons, but they could be from California immigrants, California gold rush 49 um, and also 59ers going to uh, the Pikes Peak and that gold rush as well as other mountain travelers. The horses and livestock could include horses, oxen, and also dairy cattle because Mormons were required to have one as part of their very thorough outfit before they were allowed to make the arduous journey. And I like the way that the oxbows and the river form natural fences that help the wranglers sort of keep an eye on this livestock and keep them. Now the artist moves farther again down the bluffs and he's getting farther to the south and the drawing that he creates there now Grenville Dodge's improvements can be seen in the lower right hand. There's a Native American, we can see him viewed from the back. We can see covered wagons that are circled around um, in a circle ne near the river, <coughs> excuse me, and we can even see for the first time the ferry itself with the boat crossing the river and a wagon on the boat. Now the artist is going to go down across the river and look back across the ferry and create this drawing. Now we have a drawing too that details what that ferry looked like, the fact that it needed two pretty stout trees for the cable to help them across, and also too the boat that somehow they are able to drive hitched teams of oxen or horses with wagons onto this thing and manually get it across. There's the other version, the, the uh, studio version. We can see a wagon coming down the hill uh, from Elk City where, where, where there was a Mormon dairy, the last stop that, where you could buy any supplies at all before you headed out into the Wild West. There's a fellow who seems to be asleep with his hat pulled down over his eyes on this side of the river. That's always kind of suspicious. You know, that you just think you're about to be get taken if the guy's, you know, faking like he's asleep. But, but uh, George Simon sat on that side of the river and, and gave us a good evocation of what life was like then. That's the title of the painting. That's the size of the painting. It's also in the permanent collection of the General Dodge House. <clears throat> I like this sentence in that letter the best. He is equally skillful with a paintbrush. So my, my supposition is, and I don't know this for a fact, um, I've consulted with Tom Emmett, who's the executive director of the Dodge House. He actually provided this letter from his archives. And we don't have the diary of either the artist or the general to know, but I think that he commissioned these paintings for his beautiful home on the hillside overlooking Council Bluffs. That he actually commissioned, I can't imagine George Simons taking this thing on on his own hook. He, it, 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 these paintings are so elaborate, they're so carefully organized in their detail and their perspective and they rely heavily on his sketches. He, he didn't have the wherewithal to spend months on a painting like this without patronage. In this one we can see a gentleman standing on the ground in a dark suit. Got to be Sylvanus Dodge, it's his farm. We see a man on a white horse with a feather in his cap. That I presume is his neighbor, Grenville M. Dodge, number one son, who's come to visit. We see the horses hitched to the plow. It takes a team of four to break that prairie sod because it's so thick. And we can see the oxbow and the other buildings as well. In the farthest horizon, we can see a s wagons streaming westbound, going uh, toward the Platte River where they have one more crossing. Actually, the Mormons had to stay on the north side of the Platte. That's another story, but uh, they wouldn't have to another ford until they got to the Loop River. Native Americans in the foreground are not returning to attack again, um, thankfully, but they have become friendly and they are good neighbors and there's even a Native American girl 
on one of the horses in this group who are, the men have headdresses with feathers and the riders are in single file and it is kind of a chronicle of an era. It shows that, that the Dodges had essentially a front row seat to westward expansion with the incredible amount of activity that came to the immigrant ferry which was a choke point to the greater west. The Omaha tribe had a village that was inland on the Papio Creek, somewhere just west of where is now Offutt Air Force Base. In this drawing, we can see that it was a mixture of earth lodges and teepees. Figures, horses, and the Papio River at the time, in it with its cut bank, no vegetation on the far hills. Another version of the same drawing. Carl Bodmer had been here some 20 some years beforehand and done this beautiful watercolor that showed Bellevue. This was the agency for the Omaha people. The Omaha people didn't live um, on the riverside, but they lived inland where they could farm, and that to this day is a big open floodplain. So those drawings together tell a, tell a very interesting story about the people that, um, that inhabited this area first and foremost. For my own part, I still go on pack trips in the back country in the summertime to try and get a feel, along with my artist chums, of the difficulties of, of living in, in the 19th century and setting up our easels and painting and sleeping on the ground and, and fishing and all of those things that got us into this profession to begin with. It's a digital Sabbath, among other things, and uh, it's a way to disappear for a week or 10 days that we look forward to each year. Also have traveled in, on other continents and in developing countries where men and horses are still working together today just as they did in my great-grandfather's time. Just sort of, it's kind of taking a, a kind of a peek back into the 19th century for a first-hand look. This, I used to take along those little disposable yellow Kodak cameras that were in cardboard and I'd show the little kids how to use them and so they ended up taking pictures of each other and that's how this picture came to be. Those, the paintings that I do are essentially like other artists to inform larger studio works. That's, and a, a photograph is fine but it, really you need to stand out there in the wide open air and, and do your homework and, and that's where the fun is anyway. That's where it's the most enjoyable. Interesting things always seem to happen. One other drawing of an Indian village shows the Pawnees, the neighbors to the Omaha. Completely different language, different origin, different language group, but cordial. This shows a little channel, a side channel of the Platte River, and that also their village is a combination of teepees and earth lodges. Little, the little standing lattice racks are for drying buffalo meat or other game. George Simons headed west with a group that was bound for Pikes Peak. I don't think that he had a sponsor on this. I think that it was wanderlust or hope for a business opportunity. It looks like we can see the back of him perched on a stool facing these wagons on the edge of a creek somewhere in central or western Nebraska. Here's a huge wagon train in a circle. And this is called a Mormon training camp, lassoing the steers preparatory to yoking for a start. In the middle, we can see um, a bull charging and some figures who are apparently running for their lives. <laughs> and their, their hats are flying in the air, arms are held up in abject terror, and the bull is at, sort of like Pamplona. There's a bull whacker in the background and in the foreground, kind of between the wagons, we can see a great number of men trying to haul on a steer. So this is what it was like just getting the program on the road in the morning, was getting the steers rounded up and into the yoke and onto the wagon and down the road. In the foreground, the artist seems to have been at pains for us to know that the fellow in the sombrero and the bandoleros and the bayetta jacket is no fellow Irishman, but that... <laughs> We are somewhere far to the southwest now. Maybe he's a common chero, I don't know. At any rate, uh, the artist has done a pretty nice uh, 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 evocation of, of what he saw on that day. Another, uh, a California train nooning, maybe not a Mormon train, 
um, although the people are pretty well turned out. Seems to be some sort of hubbub in the upper mid-ground there, some horsing around perhaps, but the artist, once again, he's drawn every wagon carefully, their wheels, their spokes and axles, all of the livestock that is out grazing. No detail escaped him, and he did not shirk. He was an artist with a real work ethic. So, They also, somewhere along the way in Nebraska, came upon a cow puncher, uh, an early Nebraska cow puncher and his horse. And I think that the artist was quite taken with this because of the detail in this drawing. First of all, we can see his compadre who's cooking breakfast, looking not a little dejected, and beyond him a sod house. In the years to come, thousands, tens of thousands of families would live in cave-like sod homes like this built into the side of a hill. We also see that there's a large box labeled crackers, some sort of a staple in their diet that he wanted us to be sure to be aware of. The cowpuncher and the horse have an interesting relationship. The cowpuncher is hauling on the cinch to tighten his saddle on the back of the horse for a day's work. The, ear, the uh, horse has his ears swiveled around backward to listen to the proceedings, as horses have always done and continue to do. And the horse has what's called a large, kind eye, uh, which is an attribute in a horse, but in this case it's a very large, very kind, almost human eye, and it's fixed on the cowboy who seems to be staring, <laughs> the cow puncher who seems to be staring back at the horse. It's a work, it's a professional relationship. Yes, Nancy? Do you think the perspective of how big that cook was to the sod house was real? Yeah. Yeah, it was a hovel. He looks huge compared to... No, I think you crawled in it. You didn't walk into it. You crawled into the thing. And there were reasons for that, for cool or heat or, or just the, the energy it took to build the thing. You didn't want to build it to uh, have all the comforts at home just yet. It's too big to me, the, the guy cooking. And the other thing I notice in this detail is the fact that there are these S-curved cheek pieces on the horse's bed. And those are, um, require very little rain pressure to get a response because the cr way it cranks that curb bit. And so it's a real um, uh, kind of not for beginners kind of a bit as if this horse is what would be called a billy horse or a handy horse or, or a pure D horse, whatever the cowboys, they've got a lot of names for them. That means it's, the horse is, is well broke. What I like best about it is I'd like you to just take a look at the reins and the lead rope. This is, called, this is a horse that's broke to ground tie, which means all you have to do is step off the horse and walk away from him and he won't move. He'll stand there. That's very handy. I don't know how you do it. I never had one. So I don't know how you train that in a horse. But since there's nothing to tie to out on the lone prairie anyway, I don't, uh, I don't know uh, why you wouldn't have that. And so the, the horse is well broke. The horse is um, a working cow horse. And what's going to happen next is the first thing that's going to happen when this guy climbs into the saddle is the horse is going to try and buck him off. And that horse is going to pitch a spell of bucking that's going to last two or three minutes. And this goes on every morning. Because the horse is well broken, but cow punchers don't take bucking personally. And so they won't break that out of them. And that's, that's still common to this day on a certain larger outfits. Here's a painting by a friend of mine, Bill Owen, who's a cowboy artist of America. This one's called Noon Change. So the rodeos happens again after lunch. After you've been trying to buck off in the morning, you, the horse, a new horse tries to buck you off in the afternoon, which is all part of the job. I mean, they just, I don't know, they might look forward to it. But you can see it's the same relationship between the man and the horse. The horse got his head tilted a little bit. He swiveled his ears. He's got his eye looking back. The, the cowboy's got one eye on the horse. And it's time to step into the saddle. So, you know, that's universal. It's been going along as long as there's been cow punching and probably before. And it still goes on. Look at his buddy in the background. He's bucking one out back there, hanging and rattling. And, and all the guys beyond them, they're holding a rope corral while each one of them ropes a fresh horse. So I thought that, that, that George Simon's frontier artist 
really crunched it on this one in the detail that he saw in it in a way that he was probably very taken with being in the Wild West, even though it was pretty, wasn't exactly tame around here. Um, that kind of pretty much wraps up, except for one painting. There's one more painting we're going to look at. There, I got a couple of housekeeping items, and that is thank you for coming out. It means a lot to me. I love these drawings. Tell your friends. Take out a membership. Um, these drawings are so tiny that it helps, I think, to get them on a bigger format and to share them together. One of the reasons I love Pace is it seems to me there's a, that being around other artists is tribal. You can feel the energy. And so coming here, there's all these young, bright minds that are hoping to have their talent developed. So this Pace being many different things to this community, it reminds me of an art school. And it reminds me of a, of a book called The Art Spirit by Robert Henry, which was the Bible for us as young Bohemians. And in that book, I remember this particular quote. A burial on the plains. This painting is something of a mystery to me. And um, it's in the collection of the historic General Dodge House. In the bottom left-hand corner is a fresh grave next to the dog. The dog is in black and white, which is a metaphor. His world is black and white. It's loyalty, it's devotion, it's patience. He's looking beseechingly at the writers. Should I go or should I stay? His world is clear cut to him. Ours, we're not so sure about some of this. The horse and saddle and gun of apparently the deceased are pictured right beyond. And the fellow on the white horse, who is that? Could that be Grenville Dodge in his years after the Civil War when he was attending to other business on the High Plains? He was on a white horse in a previous painting that we saw. There's a pack horse there that suggests they're nowhere near home. They're traveling cross country. They're far from them. And the dogs, they've got dogs with them. So the whole thing has many mysteries. Uh, Tom Emmett from the Dodge House thinks it's a self-portrait of the artist. He thinks that that's George Simons on that saddle. But that does little to solve the mystery. What could have happened? He's actually, uh, uh, Tom Emmett's trying to track down yet another lost Simons painting that may have been once in the Dodge House and a diary from Simon's, from George Simon's direct descendants. So, and to top it all off, they're riding off into the sunset. You can see beyond the pack horse. And the sunset's riding off into the sunset is an allegory in Western art and literature. It can be, it can be heroic or tragic or, or reckless or dangerous. It's sort of an all-purpose allegory. Um, it can be interpreted hundreds of different ways and has in film as well. But in art, it's generally heroic, in this case tragic. Interestingly, one artist uh, found it uh, an occasion for satire. <laughs> Thank you.